We are so thankful you are taking the time to join us. We pray that your faith is encouraged as you listen to another inspirational message out of God's Word. We also are ready to pray with you. If you have any prayer needs, simply email care at newlifechurchonline.com and one of our team members will connect with you and pray for you. We're also very thankful for your generosity and giving. It is because of your generosity that the ministries here at New Life are able to continue and our missionaries all around the world are able to continue to spread the good news of Jesus. Continue using our online platform by going to newlifechurchonline.com slash give. We hope you enjoy today's message. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us here at New Life Church this morning. Uh, and thank you, everybody who's watching online as well. Welcome to, uh, to church. We are the body of Christ coming together to just give all the glory and praise to our Lord and Savior. And I can tell you guys just prefer this side of the room this morning. That's okay. Um, but I'm going to open us up in worship this morning. And, uh, and then if you guys wouldn't mind standing with me, we're going to... Uh, to pray and then praise our Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, we welcome you here today. God, we thank you for another day where we get to give you glory and praise on this earth, God. We praise you for your creation. We praise you for your love and your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you for all that you've done for us, God. We thank you for salvation, for your resurrection, God, and the resurrection that we look forward to with all the other saints, God. We praise you today in Jesus' name. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe through every battle. Through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place. I believe through every battle, through every heartbreak, every circumstance I believe that you are my fortress oh, you are my portion you are my hiding place oh I believe you are the way the truth the life I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe every blessing, through every promise, through every breath I take. I believe that you are provider. You are protector, you are the one I love, oh, I believe you are the way, the truth, the light, I believe you are the way, the truth, the light. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, oh, the truth and the life. Oh, I believe. And it's 
it's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you and it's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you and it's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way the truth the life I believe you are the way the truth the life I believe you are the way the truth the life I believe you are the way oh the truth and the lie oh I believe you are and it's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new oh all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you and it's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe. Verses 31 through 34. So do not worry, say, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that what you need them. Knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. All week long I've been just meditating upon Matthew 6.33 and just seeking the Lord first. It's so easy when we have so many worries and so many needs that we start focusing on those needs rather than the one who will provide what we need. We focus on our family, what our family needs. We focus on the house and what it needs. We focus on paying the bills, because we need the bills to be paid. We focus on our friends. We focus on just relaxation and things, all, all, all these things that the Lord knows we need. But let's focus on the Lord that provides what we need. Father God, we just come to you right now, Lord, earnestly seeking you, Lord. You are our great and almighty God, provider of everything that we need. Help us to set aside every worry, 
everything that hinders us, every burden, Lord, and focus on you, the creator, the almighty, the powerful, omniscient, omnipotent, all-powerful God, Lord, you will take care of everything we need. We thank you that you are near with us. We thank you that you are here with us and that you love us. Help us to focus completely on you right now. Help us to bask in your love and your glory right now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. This 
is my confidence you've never failed and your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness none still in your hands this is my confidence you never put our faith in you today that no matter what happens in this world no matter what life throws at us God none of it catches you off guard none of it is a surprise to you but you have a plan and you've made promises to us God promises of eternal life promises of your love and your grace and your mercy God we put our faith in you again this morning giving you all the glory in Jesus name amen you may be seated. Well, good morning. It is so good to see you all this morning. Welcome to those that are watching online. Hey, I want to kick us off with something really important right now. Because I think we all need to hear this, this word. As we get started um, this morning, I, uh, I want to confess to you that Sometimes, you know, things slip through the cracks, right? You ever have something that you're like, oh, I should have and I didn't? Um, this morning, I, I was sitting, getting ready for today, and I was like, you know what? I didn't confirm with Pastor Elizabeth that she was going to do call to worship. And I was like, you know what? Just in case, Lord, just what is a scripture that I should share with today? Maybe something that aligns with this morning's message. And... Um, you know, I, I, I waited, and I felt like I had a scripture ready, and, and so I put my bookmark in, and then I, I checked with Elizabeth and made sure that, hey, are you ready for today? Are you okay with this? And she said, yeah, I got something. We're good. And, uh, you know, mine was Matthew chapter 6. Do not be anxious about your life. I feel like today, in this moment, that we need to believe that God's got a word for us. That if you're here and you are anxious, if you need to know that God, is, does, He cares for you, He loves you, He has the best for you, He has a plan for your life, know that. Because this should be proof. I, this is a silly little bookmark, but that should be proof that God is speaking to us today. And with that, I mean, we are... We're in, a, uh, we're in Acts chapter 18, which again speaks to us, and, and we're going to get into why God cares for us, that he's, he's aligning things for us, and, and, and it's, it's one of those moments as we get into the, you know, this, a new school year. I don't know if you guys, you know, many of you don't, probably don't have kids that are in school right now, but this is a different year. You know, I remember back in my day, we would get a new pair of shoes for school. Listen, if my kids aren't going to school out in public, they're, wearing, they're not wearing shoes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure they have, you know, pants on. Right? The first day of school is that day when you go in. You know, you remember high school. You go in and you're like, okay, I got these new classes. I hope they're, you know... I got new teachers, I hope they're going to be okay, and you're like, man, I'm here for nine months, and, and then you get a new, you know, you get your, if you remember your first job, right, first job is like one of those indefinite decisions you make, and, and you go in on the first day of your, of your job, and you go, I'm going to have to put up with these people for a long time, am I going to be okay, and it has this uh, you know, you can feel a little overwhelmed or a little, little, little anxious about what's, what's going to happen. Is this the right decision? And we find Paul in this, in this new place. And, and honestly, I feel like Paul is a little bit overwhelmed in the moment. And we can read the text and 
and we can pull from different points to, to kind of get there into that conclusion. But, but I think that we can find Paul. He's in this new place called Corinth. And he's in a, a little, maybe a little bit over his head. Maybe he needs God to really do something. And now we backtrack on Paul. He's on, a, on this journey. Right? He's going hundreds of miles. And he goes to different cities and he's trying to, to build churches in these different cities. And you know, he goes to Thessalonica and they kick him out. So he goes to Berea and the Thessalonians come and kick him out. And then he goes to Athens and they kick him out. And he's now in another city. When's the next time he's going to get kicked out? You ever feel discouraged? You ever feel like there is no hope? You ever feel like no one can really see my face? Because we have to wear masks everywhere. There's this isolation. There's this point where Paul is all alone. That's where we find him today. Would you stand with me as we read the word of the Lord? Acts chapter 18. If you have your Bibles, you can follow there. I read from the the ESV version. We're going to jump into the NIV here in a moment because there's a couple word in the way they translate it. But we're going to start with ESV. Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a new, a, a, a new, he found a Jew, not a new, a Jew, <laughs> named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them because he was of the same trade. He stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and rivaled him, He shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I'm sure he slapped a table when he said that too. He said, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent, for I, from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. His house, check this out, this is... This part gets me every time. His house was right next to the synagogue. Listen, this is, you know, right next door. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. This jumps, this moment here, verse 9, jumps. We don't know when this, like how soon this next verse happens in real time. But, but this is a critical moment for us. And I think this is one of those moments we can really understand Paul. Because he had a vision from the Lord. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid. But go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you. I have many in the city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Can we pray today? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that that we don't have to be anxious. We don't have to be worried because you are with us. You are here among us. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. We are, we're in a new city. And I think that, that it's important for us to understand the city and, to, and understand why Paul feels the way he does in these moments. Because I think that when we get into the Word, we can read in the Word and, and from background and culture and history and understanding, we can understand who, like, the emotion that Paul has. Because oftentimes there's no, there's not the words portrayed to understand Paul's action and, and thought process. Now we can, we can get into the word and we can read, we can read the word 
and under, to understand what God is saying. And then we can read, the, read into the word and pull out what we want to pull out. One of those is good hermeneutical practice. One of those is not. That's, you know, pulling the word out that you want and having bad theology is called blasphemy, and we don't want to do that. What we want to do is understand the word for what it is. So we have this place called Corinth. Corinth is a new city. Paul, Paul like, we, we see city after city after city. Now, what's so, what's so important to understand about Corinth, right? We, he, he just comes from Athens. Athens is a, a major place of culture and, and I, basically idol worship, but it's, it's understanding that, that place. But if you take Corinth of 30,000 people, then, or not Corinth, if you take Athens of 30,000 people, Athens has 30,000 people, Corinth would be 150,000. I mean, it's five times the city. It's massive. This is the biggest city to date that Paul has gone to. And it's also probably the raunchiest. This is a place of infidelity. This is a place of sexual promiscuity. There's a $3 word for you, right? In that day, not in Corinth, but at other places, if you were in Athens and somebody said that you were acting like a Corinthian, right? if, you were, if you were to take a Corinthian companion, there is a very negative connotation to that. To act like a Corinthian was to be loose moral or, or sexually promiscuous. It was a, a place that would take, that would probably shame Las Vegas today. We have our, our Sin City in, in America. Theirs was, there, there was no comparison. Right? This is a place, to take a, a Corinthian companion was to, to take up a prostitute. Right. That was the culture, not of the city. This was, this was widespread, wide known. That this was a city of immorality. It was also a very wealthy city. This was a city that, that was, was not just a port city. You know, you, you take a city in, in America like New York. That's a port city that, that grew and flourished because of, of you know, trade and commerce that would come in. Not only was Corinth a port city, it was a double port city. There is one point where, you know, from Rome, you could sail in to port on one side of the city and export on the other side of the city to go to Asia. This was a place where, where commerce and wealth really, really thrived. That's why it was, such a, it was able to be such a, a large city. And, and you have Paul walking into that just after being kicked out of Athens. And we look at Athens in this, we rewind just a, a bit into chapter 17. He's in Athens, right? And he, a lot of, a lot of times, a lot of the com commentators that would study this passage would say, you know what, Paul probably got cut off too early. You know, there's a chance that maybe, maybe Paul, in the way he approached Athens, he was, he was cut off because he, maybe he screwed up the presentation. Maybe he, he went to the, you know, he went into the resurrection too soon, and instead of preaching the love of Jesus, he, he preached wrong. And the, the Athenians kicked him out early. So he, he comes away from that one, you know, going, oh, man, I missed it. You, know, you, you see this in, in sports teams where, you know, you have a sports team that, that plays out of their league. Right? You have a team that, that is not very good, but, but you know, when they get beat by a team that's really good, you go, hey, you know what? They were the better team. I, 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 could, I tried to play to their level, but just couldn't make it. But then you have those, those moments where you have a team that, that plays down the level and gets beat by a team they should not have gotten beat by. You go, man, we missed that mark. You know, in Athens, he had all the opportunity because there was widespread opportunity for, for different religions, and yet he got shunned and kicked out, and he just feels like he missed the mark. And from there, he walks into 
the largest city that he's been to, the dirtiest city he's been to, the you know, farthest from God. And here's what he, he says in, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 22. See, he goes, he goes into this and says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, I, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. You have, you have Paul probably a little beat up coming into a new city, a big city, and not really even believing there's anybody else there that loves Jesus, that knows Jesus, that, that would understand the resurrection. It's all, all alone. Comes in. I, I came to you with nothing. And I think that if we could take one thing Never underestimate what God can do through you. That's good. You should remember that. Okay, let me, let me say that one more time. Listen. Never underestimate what God can do through you. Never reflect on what you can do by yourself. I think that a lot of times Paul comes in and he's, he's reflecting. You know, maybe he's, he's thinking, ah, you know, missed it missed it you ever miss it you ever screw up and go missed an opportunity there you know that opportunity that that Paul felt you know that commentators believe that Paul felt like he missed in Athens he started a church there were still believers there in fact if you fast forward a couple generations about 150 years after Paul left Athens that city that was built, you know, it was built basically to worship. The whole city was, was named after the god Athena, right? You go to the center of town, there's this big mound, and on the mound of the, of the Acropolis is this temple to the god Athena called the Parthenon. That temple, that central temple for the whole city, 150 years after, was a Christian church. In fact, the whole, the whole nation now of Greece becomes a city that, that or a, a country that knows who Jesus is, all built from the church that Paul started. To this day, on Good Friday, outside of the, the temple that was created for Athena, the Parthenon, the flag on Good Friday flies at half-mast. Because of what Paul started. Thousands and thousands of people have come to know Jesus because of the church that Paul started that he felt like he got kicked out of. Never underestimate what God can do through you. You may not see it, but God can still move through that. God can still work. You know, so you have, you have this moment that he's coming in now feeling defeated all alone, he comes into this new place. And I think that oftentimes, fear is bred through loneliness. We're in a, a, a culture now that is completely separated. The enemy is trying to separate every one of us from each other so that we don't have community. We're designed to have relationships. Paul's by himself. And he comes in. What happens? He finds Aquila. He finds Aquila, this, this man that in a city that he, he assumes is so far from God, he doesn't know where to start. He, he comes in and he finds a guy that God has provided in this, this unique trans, you know, trans, I don't know the word I'm looking for. This, this u unique connection that brings these two guys together because they're the, not only are they, do they both 
like believed the resurrection. They both loved the Lord, but they're both tent makers. That's such a unique trait, and for Paul, this is a perfect trait. So, understanding where Paul's coming from. Why is he a tent maker? What's like he works at the? This is like the ancient Bass Pro. Okay, you know everybody in Corinth wants to go camping, so they need tents. Right now, this different kind of tent. Okay, this is this is like the design and what they would you know house with tents were were not necessarily what we would think of as tents, but more probably more of an understanding would be he would be a leather worker. Tents in that day were made of leather and, and they would, he would basically just have a pouch that he would carry with him, that he would work with leather and he would have his, you know, his scissors and his needle and thread and he would have these opportunities that he would drum up business wherever he was. It's perfect for his kind of, you know, in a sense nomadic lifestyle that he could be in any place and, and have a little bit of work to do. And in that day, it was good for him to, to prove his, his worth or be able to build on where he was because there were also a lot of, you know, in a sense, religious hucksters or, or swindlers, panhandlers that would, they would drum up this new religion or this Eastern religion or, or something and they would go, hey, pay me and I'll tell you about it. And Paul wanted to, to build the community, build the church. So he would work. And he would build, he would, you know, make tents and he would work with leather and then he would go and reason in the synagogue. And he would have this, this unique kind of rhythm of his life. And so in this place where he's all alone, he finds these two, this husband and wife, right? And this is a unique moment because there's not very many places in the, in the New Testament with, with a, a, a righteous husband and wife, right? You have, you have an understanding. You know, Peter had a wife. You know what we know about her is that she had a mom because Jesus healed her. That's about it, right? Aquila and Priscilla are this, this unique couple that they're in the ministry together and they're working and laboring together and they're, they're doing this and then Paul comes in and they partner together and they... they Really, it gives Paul this foothold. And then, then he doubles down because then his old comrades come. So he has this, now he's, he's starting to, to get this rhythm and, and Silas and Timothy then join him and it's this shot in the arm that's like, yeah, here we go. We're going to make this happen. We're going to double down and, and go. And it actually, if you, if you have a different version it says, when, Timothy and, or when Silas and Timothy came to Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. You know, ESV says that Paul was occupied with the word. But I like that translation, that Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. Why did he do that? Because he had, he had both his old comrades that... They, they saw, they were in jail with him. They have fought and suffered with him. They went and stayed in Berea, and they, they built the church and stabilized what was going on in Berea, and then they caught up to him through Macedonia. Chances are they went through some churches, and, and not only were they comrades, not only were they there to support him, they probably brought a, a fairly generous offering with them so that he didn't have to... to pull money from the, this baby church in Corinth, and he also didn't have to do his tent making. That he was able to double down and exclusively preach the word. And then what happens? Like always, he gets under somebody's skin, offends somebody, and they start fighting with Paul, and they go, Paul, we are firing you! And he goes, no, you're not. I quit. <laughs> Boom, I'm out. Someday. <laughs> I don't ever want to do that. But, you know, there's those moments when you're like, oh, that would be fun to do. I don't want to quit here. But if, you know, I should probably just move on, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there was this one time that I felt like jo I should tell Josh I quit before he left. But you can't quit. I quit. No, I'm just kidding. But he, he quits, 
and he goes right next door. Right? There's got to be some sort of, you know, contract as a rabbi you have to sign that says you can't preach within so many feet of the synagogue. Right? You can't put a church right next to another church. That's wrong. <laughs> you, ever, you know, you, you drive by those places, you know, a lot of times like old towns will have, they'll be like a crossroad and there's four church or churches on the corner. And you're like, why? Why? You can't be like a, a block down. No, he's right next door. He's right next door. So in the eyes of the Jews, they walk into the synagogue. They see every, every time Paul's there. They see him preaching right next door. Chances are they probably could hear him from inside the synagogue, hearing him preach. What a bum, that guy. And we look at that and we go, Paul, why would you? You know, he must, he must really hate the Jews. Right? He must have a lot of animosity toward these people that all they do is fight with him. Why can't they just get along? And the truth is, is that Paul, Paul loved the Jews. I think that, I think that if, if Jesus, when he spoke to Paul, would have let him preach to the Jews, that he would have stayed with the Jews. He was a Jew. And he... He would come in every time he'd come to a new city. He would go to the synagogue because he was still, he still had what I mean, essentially like rabbinic authority. He was a rabbi. He was trained to be not just a Jew, but a really, really good one. So then he would go in and he would reason in the synagogues because of his abilities and his opportunity with his training to go into those places, and he would have some authority, and even in these new synagogues. It even goes on in, in chapter 18. It says that he had, he had cut his hair because he took a vow. He took the vow of a Nazarite in this moment, and he, his hair, you know, in, in those, there's, there's a lot to that, but the point I want to make to you is that he was, he was not just a Jew. He, he loved his Jewish people. And he wanted them to understand the resurrection of Jesus. That Jesus was the Messiah that they were waiting on. They were waiting and waiting and waiting and they couldn't find him. And there he was. Right next door. And there's those moments that, that we, we get into these rhythms of life. And, and honestly, I feel like we get these rhythms that go, Hey, you know what? I'm doing, I'm doing really good. And then something happens, and I'm like, oh, man, I'm all by myself. What am I going to do? This isn't working. I don't know what to do. And then we, we find out that victory, and we go, okay, I'm in, and I'm going to make it, and this is going to happen. And, and then we go, oh, my goodness, I'm out. This is awful. I'm going to just stand in the corner for a minute because I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. Seth, every, every Sunday I find Seth here going, I can't do it. I can't. <laughs> just kidding. But we have those moments when, when we feel that rhythm. And I, I think that Jesus comes to him in a vision because he was ha having that moment. And he says, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, Paul. You are okay. I've got you. Don't worry. No one's going to harm you. I have many people that you don't know about in the city. I have people, Paul. Don't worry. Honestly, it struck me when I was reading this. It was a couple weeks ago, and we were walking through, and there's this moment of loneliness that we experience, and then God opens our eyes. He says, listen, what you find as, as defeat, what you find as fear, what you find as as struggle, don't worry, because I am with you, I am there, and there are, there are people. It'll be okay. You know, he would have, I, I assume in this moment, this is a complete assumption of Eric's, but when I read this, I see 1 Kings 19. Okay, there's this, this guy, Elijah, 1 Kings. He's a prophet of the Lord. And in the day when he was prophet, he was all alone. In fact, he went to battle all alone, and there was this competing God named Baal, and, and prophets of God had converted over, and they were now prophets of Baal. 
And, you know, Elijah had this great victory because he challenged 400 prophets of Baal, and, and they went up to this mountain, and, and they both built an altar, and he said, okay, you go first, you go ahead and see if you can, if Baal will come down on fire, and, and he didn't, and so Elijah says, watch this, ba-boom, and there was fire and consumed, and he defeats the prophets of Baal, right, great victory, hooray, you know, I am, I'm alone, but I got God, and you guys stink, right, that's what he's thinking right there, and then a girl tries to kill him, and he runs, runs away, he says, I, you know, Queen Jezebel is, is scared, in my microphone, she's scary, and this and this, and I can't do it. He runs into the wilderness and hides in a cave by himself. From there, 1 Kings 19.10. I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Lord of Israel, I have forsaken your, or for the people of Israel, not the Lord, the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left and they seek to take my life. This is the moment that is the lowest point from Elijah. We know that, we, you know, you could fast forward in that story and know that he's not. And he comes back and with fury and the Lord provides. It's that moment that I would assume that Paul would go, I remember this. God did a victory then and he's going to do a victory now. And I think as we, as we wrap up here, as we, we kind of, I want us to go into a moment that we can reflect. If you're discouraged, if you're anxious, if you're fearful, God is with us. He's with you. He's with you. Right? This is the moment that, that Paul stands firm and goes, okay, I'll be okay. God is with me. This moment that, that we, we look at, we can say, I am not alone. I am not alone. Maybe we should all just, church, if you have a neighbor, make sure you have a mask on. Tell your neighbor, I am not alone. I'm not alone. God is with you. You think, maybe you think, maybe in your, your, your alone time, maybe you have these moments that you go, I can't do it. You're right. You can't. That's the beauty of it. Never underestimate. Never underestimate what God can do through you. Never underestimate what God can do through you. And never focus on what you do on your own. Because if we could do it on our own, then, then we don't need God. Right? That's, the whole, that's the whole crux of what we're, how we understand salvation is we don't, we don't get to just go to heaven without Jesus. Salvation happens through him, through his death on the cross and his resurrection. We get to be made whole. I think oftentimes we walk through life and we go, okay, I'll accept Jesus and then my life will be perfect. I'll accept Jesus and then everything should line up. And that's pretty much the opposite. When we have trials, when we have issues, when we have, when we face adversity, we go, Lord, be with me. He's not going to take you out of trials. He's going to give you strength through those trials. He's not going to take away the trials. The, the, the issues. He's not going to take away the hardships. He's going to bring you through them. Psalm 23 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall feel no evil. It doesn't say, Hey, so I can walk on the mountain and look at the valley from afar. When I, when I, 
walk through it. I don't have to fear. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to struggle in, in, on my own because you are with me. God is with you. Would you stand with me? Seth's going to play for a moment, and I want us to reflect. What ang- anxiety do you face? What fear do you face? What trials are you facing right now that you need God to walk with you today? I want us to begin to pray. Just in, on our own. Maybe you can pray for the person next to you. Maybe we can have a moment. We just seek the Lord.
When I can't see past the dark of night Remind me you're always by my side When the lies speak louder than the truth Remind me I belong to you When I can't see past the dark of night Remind me you're always by my side You're by my side We are the sons, we are the daughters of God No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the Lord's and He will never forsake His own. We are the sons. We are the daughters of God. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the Lord's and He will never forsake His own. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. Father, we thank you that you have adopted us into your family. We are your sons and daughters. We are not alone. You will never forsake us. You'll never leave or abandon us because you are a good, good Father. Lord, we pray today that, that we would not be alone. We would not feel alone. We would not feel abandoned. But we would take courage and strength that you are with us. Father, as we go from here, I pray that you send us out send us out with the power of the Holy Spirit and the favor of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us today. A couple things that I want you to remember. Next week, we start prayer and fasting. 21 days. We're going to do 21 days prayer and fasting. You don't have to fast. We're going to get some more details next week on that because we believe that we're going to set aside 21 days to be a part of this, you know, whether we want to go, you want to go one meal a week, maybe you want to do once a day, maybe you want to do something every single day, maybe you want to get rid of media in your life for 21 days, maybe you want to focus on, you know, setting aside, you know, there's other options like the Daniel fast or, uh, you know, maybe there's another, the way they used to fast in the Old Testament would probably be closer to uh, anytime there's daylight, they don't eat. You know, so they would devote themselves from sunup sunrise to sundown to not eat. Maybe that's something you want to try. Maybe it's, you know, full days for a couple times a week. You know, there are lots of options. So we're going to devote August 23rd through September 12th that we are going to dedicate that time to prayer and fasting. And we would love for you to join with us because we anticipate God's going to move big time because of this. You know, okay, Gabrielle's on board. Yeah. Right. No, we, are, we believe that God's going to do something great. We're going to kick that off on the 23rd. Next, next Sunday here, 6 p.m., we're going to do an encounter service. You guys remember those? It's been a while. This whole mask thing and COVID thing has screwed up prayer and fast, or not prayer, encounter services. We're bringing them back, all right? So it's going to be awesome. 23rd, we're going to be here, and then we're going to cap it off on the 12th in Aurora. And, and New Life Indian Fellowship is going to host that one. It's going to be awesome. So those are, that's our prayer and fast coming up. Also, I don't know if you know this, but Wednesday nights we brought those back. The 
Jesus. And if you need encouragement, if you need strength, if you need to just come and pray, these are loose, you know, just come and pray and worship and be in the presence of the Lord. Wednesday, 7 p.m., be here. If you want to give today, you can give. There's a steel box in the back on the wall. You can give in that or you can give online at newlifechurchonline.com slash give. Uh, if you go to stonenewlife.com, this is another one. I know, I'm sorry. stonenewlife.com slash connect. Uh, that is our connect card since we don't have connect cards. We'd love for prayers, uh, prayer needs, any anything that is going on in your life, you want to connect with us, go to that. We love you all. We'll see you on Wednesday. Wait, I'm sorry. So oh, September 13th. I don't know if you guys know this, but New Life Stow turns one. It has been a year. Holy moly. It's been quite a year, too. I don't know if we've had some, some ups and downs and funs and not so fun, but we turn one. We're going to do an all, all campuses service. All campuses here Sunday morning that day. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. So be here for that. But be here on Wednesday and the Sundays before then. That'd be cool too. All right. Love you all. We'll see you next week.